Okay, so now the next two lectures this week are going to, to some extent, go together in the sense that both of them are really going to focus on this interaction between our conception of who we are um, and our conception of, well, really the influence of the world around us. So it's going to be a mix of those things, of, of trying to think about, you know, when we emit some behavior, did that behavior come from us? Um, you know, is it really our fault or are we the source of what we did or is it something in the context around us that ultimately was the cause of our behavior and how do we know and how do we make those attributions um, and you know in the next lecture um, just how powerful is our context in determining our behavior and there'll be a really shocking study uh, another yes another one uh, that we'll talk about then but for this lecture, I want to kind of set up a lot of these issues and get you thinking about them uh, while also introducing you to some basic social psychology phenomena. So let's do that. Week six, lecture three, protecting and empowering the self. Um, sounds kind of ominous. I like ominous. Um, I also like silly things. Like I noticed that I could have said sort of individual versus context, um, but self versus else. It struck me while I was making this slide that these are the same letters in different orders, and for some reason that meant I had to use them. So self versus else. Um, that's really what we're going to be talking about here. We are we find ourselves. Um, often embedded in some context, a social context usually. Uh, and that means that things that we do or that things that others do, we can attribute either to them or the context. How do we do that? There's something called the self-serving bias that um, refers to, uh, relates to the issue of when we're thinking about ourselves. So if we ourselves are in some situation, how do we make that attribution? And, and the self-serving bias says, well, it depends on what happens in the situation. That generally speaking, generally speaking, when we encounter some sort of failure or trouble or problem, we will attribute it to the environment. Okay, so I come in and I do an exam and I do really poorly on an exam. Well, that's because it was a stupid exam and the professor created questions that made no sense. Um, they created a bad exam. I did poorly because of them, not because of me. Now, if I do really well on that exam, if I have success, then it was all me. So successes we tend to attribute to ourselves. We are the cause of the successes in our life, but other people, other events, the world around us is the cause of failure. Now, this, this sounds kind of, well, self-serving, <laughs> as the notion would suggest. We're going to take credit for our successes, and we're going to blame the world for our failures. Uh, but it turns out, uh, social psychologists argue that this is, in fact, very important for preserving our sense of self-esteem, that we have to have this notion that we ourselves are um, good people, that we're, that we're valuable, that, that we have some intrinsic worth, and that this self-serving bias is one way of doing this. So if we kind of take ownership of the successes and say, yeah, I did that, you know, that makes us feel good. But we don't, if we don't take ownership of the failure so much, um, then again, that doesn't bring us down so much. So it keeps our self-esteem reasonably high, which prevents us from feeling worthless and depressed. So uh, this self-serving bias can be really advantageous that way. It can help us keep on an emotional good level. Um, now, I certainly don't want to imply that this is true of every individual. The self-serving bias is something that's seen when you do look at a group of people and you ask them to make attributions about successes or failures. But you will find some individuals and in fact depressed individuals are especially like this they can reverse all of this a depressed individual can think failures are all their fault and successes well that was just lucky that was just they happen to be in the right place at the right time so a depressed person can sometimes take ownership of failure and not of success and that can be something that really feeds a depressive state some therapies cognitive behavior therapy for example tries to change that way of thinking and tries to get a depressed person to think more like 
non-depressed people to actually have this self-serving bias because it's helpful. Okay. Well, all right. So now we're talking about how we think of ourselves in situations. What about how we think of others? Well, it turns out that's a little more complicated and it depends a lot on our knowledge of the other person. If somebody else is successful, are they successful because they were good or were they successful because they were in the right place at the right time, so to speak? Um, it turns out our attributions of success are a little variable. It's not really easy to tell a clear picture. But attributions of certain kinds of failure are much more predictable. And in fact, there's something called the just world hypothesis. It especially applies to victims. So imagine you see someone that's homeless or perhaps a rape victim or perhaps even a victim from a storm. There is a lot of examples that very often humans will show what's called this just world hypothesis, which actually means that they tend to think the victims deserved what happened to them in some way, that something about the victim themselves brought on their situation. So in a homeless case, for example, um, often, people will assume that, well, somebody is homeless because they're lazy, because um, they're not trying to find a job. Um, it's their fault that they're in the situation they're in. Uh, perhaps even more extreme, rape victims, you will hear situations like, well, that woman was dressing provocatively. She was kind of asking for it. Um, you know, asking for it? Does anybody ask to be raped? But literally, you will, in, in court cases sometimes, you will get that sort of vibe from jurors that a woman was behaving in such a way perhaps she was drinking a lot of alcohol in a place where there were a lot of men perhaps she was dressing very provocatively perhaps she was acting very sexual in some sense now we all know intellectually none of those things um, justify somebody raping her and yet when you look at people's discussion of these issues you see hints that yeah she kind of brought it on um, she wasn't like a, just a pure random victim. Um, she had a role in what happened to her. Um, now, of course, it could be a, a he as well. I, I shouldn't be assuming uh, only females can be raped. Um, but what about storm victims? I put a question mark after that. There have been some studies that have even asked about people who've been hit by hurricanes or something like that, um, where, some, where quite often um, participants will say things like, well, they, they shouldn't live in an area that's susceptible to, to storm. If you're going to live in Florida, of course you're going to get hit by a storm. So it's your fault. Um, or, well, if you're going to live in a storm region, you'd better build a strong house. And if a tornado comes through and rips your house apart, well, it's your fault for not having an appropriate house. So all of these things are consistent with this just world hypothesis. Now, what we mean by just is just, as in justice. Um, and the idea here is that we believe people become victims because of something they do. And the reason psychologists think we do this is because we all want to believe that if we are good people, if we are smart people, then misfortune will not um, come to us. That it comes to those who deserve it. And as long as we live a life that doesn't invite mishap, then maybe we will be secure. Maybe we will be safe. So the notion is this is really reflecting our, our desire for security, our need to feel secure. And so by thinking that when bad things happen to other people, it's because they deserve it, we're actually kind of telling ourselves if we don't deserve it, bad things won't happen to us. So again, another form of sort of self-preservation of, uh, in this case, the security of the self kind of interesting. Okay, now there's one other concept I want to bring into play here because it will come into play throughout this course um, and it's related to this too. It's the notion of locus of control. It's more forward looking. It's not so much about you saw something happen and what attributions do you make. It's more about um, there's some challenge ahead of you. Um, how likely do you think you, you will meet this challenge? And a difference has been drawn between people who have what's called an external versus an internal locus of control. And what this actually means is, if you have an external locus of control, you think success depends a lot on 
chance environment, the chance things that happen in, in the world. That the outcome is determined more by the world than anything that you will do. So in a way you're saying that you yourself do not have a whole lot of ability in shaping how things turn out. That it's external forces that will shape that. You're kind of a passenger. That's somebody who has an external locus of control. They see the control as it being external. Someone with an internal locus of control has the feeling that they can determine how events unfold. So, um, you know, if you really believe that, if you say, you know what, I'm going into a job interview and I think that if I prepare well and if I present myself well and, you know, if I hit a certain few points I want to hit, I can land this job. It's within my power to do so. I have the control. That would be somebody with an internal locus of control. Somebody with an external locus would say, well, you know, I'll go and I'll do my best, but ultimately I don't think I can have that much of an effect over this. They're probably looking for a certain kind of person that does a certain thing, so I'll go in, show them who I am, um, and I'll either fit what they're looking for or I won't. And if I fit, then I'll get the job, but it'll be more because of them and the context than because of me. Whereas the internal thinks it's because of me. Okay, This relates to the issue of empowerment. People who have an external locus of control often feel like victims. They feel like things happen to them. Whereas people with an internal locus feel more like they are leaders or they are at least in command of their life. And often this is a very important thing for people to have. Um, to, to literally empower them. And let me give you one taste of that. Um, one of the problems that Alzheimer's patients have is early on in the disease, they, they start wanting to wander. And sometimes late at night, they want to wander. They feel hyperactive. And so they, they leave the house and they start walking somewhere. And of course, they often sometimes have major memory impairments. So they're out walking and suddenly they can't remember the way back home. Uh, they don't know which way to go. Uh, and so they get lost. Uh, at some point, imagine this is your parent that this is happening to, at some point the caregiver will jail the patient. They will literally say, you know what, we're going to have to lock all the doors. You can now not leave unless one of us is with you because we don't want you getting lost. But really what you've now done is take away some control from this person's life. It is no longer up to them to uh, when they can do things um, and how they can do things. It is up to you and you are an external force. So you're shifting that, you're, you're disempowering them, you're taking away this power, putting it to the environment and that's often when a lot of Alzheimer's patients start getting a little nasty and they start having a lot of negative emotionality. Disempowerment does that. You begin to feel like a victim and none of us like that feeling. That's locus of control. Okay, so we have those things in place. Um, just to remind you, we have the self-serving bias, which tends to preserve our self-esteem. Um, we have the just world hypothesis, which makes us feel comfortable when we see bad things happening to other people. We think they deserved it, so that makes us feel a little more secure. And we have this concept of locus of control, which is just something that people vary on. Um, some people are more internal than others, and even within our lives, sometimes we feel more in control, um, and at other times we feel less. So those concepts all relate to how we think of ourselves versus the environment we find ourselves in, and they're all going to be very relevant to the next lecture, which really addresses the, the, the critical question, why do good people sometimes do evil things? And it's going to be about this interaction. So that's why I wanted to set it up. All right, so um, if you want to check out any of this a little more, I've got some videos here about each of the three things we just talked about, self-serving bias, locus of control, belief in a just world. Um, and similarly, I've got some, some websites that talk about these things in different contexts, including for the locus of control, I brought in the depression context and, and the feeling that most depressed people have that it doesn't matter what they do, it'll turn out bad. That's what they think. Um, they have no control in determining events. Um, so check that out. That'll, that'll show you how important this link, this notion of locus of control is. All right, so that's what I have for this lecture. I'm going to leave it there, but um, I'm looking forward to the next one. So I hope to see you there.